Hello everyone, Russ Barkley back again with another commentary on some late breaking news related to ADHD. This dealing with the risk of ADHD among the offspring of pregnant women who took acetaminophen, that's Tylenol here in the U.S., compared to those who did not. Now, the Epic Times reported on a study that was published last month in February on the relationship of acetaminophen exposure during pregnancy and risk for ADHD in offspring. Now, this study also had a news commentary released by the investigators. <clears throat> it's right here. It was published over at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Although, by the way, the study was done using data collected on women out in or down in Tennessee. No matter, the study is claiming that the exposure to acetaminophen during pregnancy, particularly during the second trimester, was associated with a markedly higher increase in risk of ADHD in the offspring. Indeed, about a three times greater risk, especially when the drug was taken during the second trimester. Now, we have seen a lot of previous reports on this kind of an association. Many studies have found such an association, others have not. And remember what I've told all of you previously, correlation is not causation, particularly when the studies have not controlled for the largest confounding factor in the data set, which is the genetic risk for ADHD. That is the transmission of the risk from mother to offspring. There are many reasons why we might expect women with ADHD to be more likely to use this pain medication especially during pregnancy, than might typical women. Why might that be the case? Because women with ADHD report having more headaches, more migraine headaches specifically, more fibromyalgia or other complaints of pain and fatigue. We know that adults with ADHD, women included, report more vague bodily complaints that is, medical complaints about their bodily functioning than do other individuals. And this not only includes headache, but also spinal pain, joint pain, and so on. So given that women with ADHD have more of these various pain-related factors or conditions, it seems more likely that they would be likely to use acetaminophen more than other women to deal with these factors. All of this is to say that acetaminophen use during pregnancy, rather than being a cause of ADHD, might simply be a marker that the mother has the condition herself. And until we control for that mother's level of ADHD and its genetic transmission to the children, we really can't say anything about the use of this drug during pregnancy and whether or not it increases risk for ADHD. But that didn't stop these investigators from making those kinds of claims that they believe that their study does show such an association, that it does mean that this drug may be increasing risk, and they've asked the FDA to review its guidelines around the recommendation of the use of this medicine during pregnancy because of the results of their study. So, you know, these kinds of claims need closer inspection because we're talking about changing public policy here for a drug that is the most common drug taken by pregnant women to control pain. About 40 to 65 percent of pregnant women will take this medication at some point during their pregnancy to control pain, according to the National Institutes of Health. And therefore, it's important that we get this right and that we shouldn't be going around changing public policy willy-nilly unless we have very good evidence to suggest that there might be something about this drug that increases risk. I'm not saying there isn't. I'm simply saying that the studies done to date can't 
draw that conclusion. Now, the study we're talking about here was the lead author was Renan Baker, and this study was published over in the journal Nature Mental Health, and it's entitled The Associations of Maternal Blood Biomarkers of Prenatal APAP. By the way, that's acetaminophen exposure, and they're looking at placental gene expression and the risk for ADHD in the offspring. I'm going to ignore the genetic uh, expression in the placenta here because I think it's not necessarily relevant to what we're looking at, and that is risk that the drug poses for having ADHD. Now, I want to take a closer look at this study because there are a number of problems with it. First of all, it uses a very small sample of individuals relative to past studies that have been done that have used entire populations. This study used just 307 mother-child pairs. In addition, they were all of African-American ancestry or ethnicity. Now, another marker of a problem with the study is that that 307 represents only about 25 to 30 percent of all the mother-child pairs that were involved in this larger study. So there were more than 1,200 mother-child pairs being followed in that study, and they used just 307. And I think that's because these were the women who were willing to give blood samples during their pregnancy and to have their placentas investigated or studied for these immune system markers that the investigators were looking for. So again, overall, based on this very small sample of black mother-child pairs, we find they found about a two to three times increase in risk for ADHD in the offspring. By the way, it was almost entirely found in the girls in the study. The investigators say they don't know why that is. I don't either, but it's yet another sign that there is something about this study that isn't right. So we have a small sample limited to one ethnic group. Only about 25% of the sample has been investigated. Lots of reasons to think that there's a problem here, not the least of which is there was no effort on the part of the investigators to control for the family genetics and the risk that poses for ADHD. And that is very important because as we know, 70 to 80% of the variation in ADHD symptoms in the population is due to genetics, genetic differences. So if you're gonna control for a confounding factor in your study, that's the one you have to control for before you can say anything about what the associations or correlations you found might mean. So this study in no way demonstrates causation. And because of the factors I've already mentioned, there is good reason for us to be very suspicious about this study. And another reason for that is to look over at the largest study ever done that was published last year that is in 2024. This is a study of the entire population of Sweden. It uses, get this, 185,900 mother-child pairs are looked at in this study. Now, that is 600 times larger than the sample that was used in the study that got all the attention. So friends, as you know, when you're doing research, the larger the sample, the better the results are likely to represent nature, so to speak, to be the correct results, to be robust. That is, we can place a lot more faith in the findings of a large study than we can in a very small study, like the one that was reported in the media. What did this study find? Basically, nothing. The investigators report that there was just a very slight increase in the risk for ADHD among mothers who took the medication 
compared to mothers who didn't. And by the way, this study also used an attempt at genetic controlling for families, that is family risk of ADHD, by comparing the children who had been exposed to acetaminophen to their full siblings. And when you do the sibling controls, the initial associations are dramatically weakened or may even be non-significant entirely. So the investigators report at the end or their conclusion is that acetaminophen use during pregnancy was not associated with risk for autism, ADHD, or intellectual disability when appropriate sibling control analyses were conducted. Very important there. So you've got a little tiny study done in the US, primarily with one ethnic group that doesn't do any genetic controls compared to this large scale Swedish study published a year ago, 600 times larger, that does try to control for genetic risk and doesn't find anything. Now, there are previous papers, as I've said, that have found some association, but they are of mixed methodological quality. That is, study quality ranges from low to primarily medium, and some are high quality studies. So I'm just gonna end by calling your attention to an editorial published in Obstetrics and Gynecology just last month. This is an expert panel review of all of the evidence available on acetaminophen exposure during pregnancy and risk for ADHD and autism. And in conducting this, they went through 56 different studies and commentaries and editorials. They found out of these a small set of studies that they felt were of high enough quality to explore, that is nine studies, and to see how the original data stacked up. What did they find? They also looked at other meta-analyses that were done. And their conclusion is that although most studies reported some positive findings between drug exposure and risk for ADHD, they are difficult to interpret because they have important biases and they have a high degree of selection bias. There is variability in the selection criteria and there is unmeasured and uncontrolled family confounding variables, as I've already mentioned, such as genetics of the disorder as transmitted from mother to child. They do report that in the few studies, such as the Swedish study that attempted to control for genetics by comparing kids to their full siblings who weren't exposed to acetaminophen, the evidence is markedly reduced. That is, any findings of a positive relationship are reduced when we control for family confounding and may even become non-significant. So the expert panel reports that or concludes that according to the current scientific evidence, in utero exposure to acetaminophen is unlikely to confer a clinically important risk of childhood ADHD or ASD. The current level of evidence does not warrant changes to clinical guidelines on the treatment of fever or pain during pregnancy. It does not warrant the FDA going back and reviewing yet again its policies and recommendations on this matter. Even though the investigators of that small study claim that that is what they should do. And the answer to that is no, they should not. So there you have it, folks. At this point, we can't say if acetaminophen exposure does pose a risk for ADHD or autism spectrum disorders. The evidence available right now simply does not allow us to draw that kind of conclusion. And when the best studies and the largest studies are done that attempt to control for genetics, in the families, they find little, if any, relationship between drug exposure and risk. As always, more research is needed, but at this point, there is no reason for people to be concerned, upset, alarmed, scared about using acetaminophen or Tylenol for pain management during pregnancy. 
And also, I think that the authors of the earlier paper need to be more measured, conservative, and circumspect in their conclusions from their study, particularly when speaking to the media. They should know better. They should have known about this editorial from this expert panel before they spoke about their results. But no matter, we can put all of this in context and say, as I've concluded at this point, no evidence that use of this drug during pregnancy increases risk for ADHD as far as any causal interpretation is concerned. So that said, I hope that you can feel comfortable in reporting to family members, others who ask you about this study by telling them about our conclusions here that at this point, we don't know if there is such an associate or a correlation or causation and the best studies suggest no problem. Okay. Thanks for joining me, everybody. I really appreciate it. I'm going to put the citations to these papers in the description and I hope you'll, if you want to explore them further that you'll do so. Thanks for watching this channel and as always, live well, be well, and take care. Bye for now.